In the programme which follows, reporter John Pilger expresses a personal view. America is truly God's own country. The natural bounty that pours from this land is almost too great to comprehend. America controls half of all the world's wheat, two-thirds of all cereal foods, 95% of all soybeans. That's why President Harry Truman called America the breadbasket of the world, and indeed she has been the most generous in the world. That spirit is now changing in Washington, the Washington of Dr. Henry Kissinger. A member of Dr. Kissinger's staff has said publicly, to give food aid to countries just because they are starving is a pretty weak reason. In every major deal Dr. Kissinger has done in recent years, food has been a decisive factor. For agreeing to detente, Russia got American food. For signing a Middle East peace agreement, Egypt got American food. For prolonging the war in Vietnam, the generals of Saigon got American food, which they sold to buy arms. In the last few years, the world has been much obsessed with the oil weapon. But as the following half hour will show, there is a new, more powerful weapon, food. And this one is lethal. In the breadbasket of the world, the average American eats almost a ton of grain every year. In the hungry world, which is most of humanity, the average person eats less than a fifth of this amount, and that's barely enough to survive. Four million Americans belong to weight-watching organizations, and in the United States, obesity is now officially listed as a cause of death. In Britain, we don't eat quite as much, but like the Americans, we feed most of our grain to meat-producing animals, grain that would feed some 20 million hungry people. In effect, we choose to feed animals rather than people. People starve to death for a number of reasons. The least understood reason is the denial of food for motives of politics and profit. For example, last April, in a federal court in New Orleans, two of the largest American food companies were found guilty of shipping deliberately short-weighted grain to poor countries. Grain which had been paid for in precious hard currency and had earned the companies a fat profit of one and three quarter million dollars. The companies were given the maximum fine of just half a million dollars. And these are only some of 65 criminal indictments outstanding against American food companies. Of course, starving countries can buy American grain, if they can afford it. But since 1971, the American Secretary of Agriculture, Dr. Earl Butts, has evolved a policy to guarantee high food prices in order to please the powerful farmers' lobby. Under this policy, the price of American grain can be kept artificially high in world markets, American farmers can prosper, and the food companies can speculate and Dr. Butts can have what he calls agropower. And while many people have died, Secretary of Agriculture Butts has refused to recognize any international agreement to hold back the price of food. I'm not very sympathetic with the food needs of a nation where their, where their governments and their leaders are constantly demeaning the United States, are, are, are aligning themselves with the Soviets, are, are condemning us for being international imperialists and that kind of thing. I don't think we are. I think our record clearly demonstrates we're not. Mr. Secretary, what do you mean by agripower? Agripower is a concept that we have developed here in connection with, with food power. I think it's one of the great sources of strength in the days ahead. In the world today, we have two major power types. We have petropower and agripower. 
with the zooming population of the world that's going to increase 80% in the next 25 years, food is bound to move to the front burner. It's going to be one of the most important things we face. How do we feed 80% more people than we have today? That's what I mean by agri-power. I think we in the United States have agri-power. We have the world's major breadbasket. We are the world's major source of, of feed grains and food grains that move in international channels. Last year, over half the grains that moved in international trade originated from the United States. We have that agri-power right here. This is the Center of Concern, a respected Washington organization which monitors U.S. food policy. Peter Henrio is a director. If I have something that you need, I have a certain power over you. The United States and Canada, our northern neighbor, presently control some 80% of the food that is in international markets. We're the breadbasket of the world in many, many ways. And that means that we have power. That means that things that we want to see done in the world, uh, we have a good, strong arguing point when we say uh, we have food, you need food, uh, we have certain things we'd like to see do done, uh, will you do them? You, politically done, of course. Politically done. Yes. Well, now, how, how, give us some examples of that. How is, is this, this terrific power of, of American food used for political aims? I think one of the clearest things that uh, we've had in recent years, and something that came home as quite a shock to people in the United States, was the way the United States in the early part of the 70s, so 71, 72, 73, 74, how the food that we were distributing to a hungry world Mm. actually was being used for political purposes. Uh, we have a piece of legislation in this country called Public Law 480, PL 480. And under it, we basically uh, share with the rest of the world uh, food. But in the early 1970s, uh, it was discovered uh, by the American public that the major amount of food that was being distributed under PL 480 was going to South Vietnam, Cambodia, Chile, and a couple of the Arab oil states. Basically, we were using food to shore up, to support, to win the favor of nations that uh, politically were very important to us. Mm -hmm. I think that this came as something of a shock. For instance, in the fiscal year 1974, the United States uh, distributed some almost 50 percent of the food that it sells on sort of low interest rates under PL 480 went to Cambodia and Vietnam, went under situations which, as a matter of fact, were military aid. It was not uh, humanitarian aid. Surely it helped hungry people, but it was not primarily guided for a humanitarian reason, but for a military reason, a political reason, and that's agri-power. Dr. Henry Kissinger has stated categorically that the vast majority of American food aid is for humanitarian purposes. This is not true. In 1974, the General Accounting Office in Washington found that most American food aid did not go to starving countries and that a very large amount went to regimes that were politically acceptable to Washington and to Dr. Kissinger. A prime example of this is Chile. One of the weapons that brought down the democratically elected Allende government in Chile was food. On Dr. Kissinger's orders, most American food aid to Chile was cut off and hunger and disorder followed leading to a military takeover which brought Chile back into the Washington fold. And of course, once the generals and admirals were in power, Chile got its food back. Not far from Dr. Kissinger's office in the State Department is the so-called ZAP office, which monitors the voting of countries in the United Nations. If certain small and poor countries, which are dependent on American food aid, vote against the policies of the United States, they are zapped, which means simply that their food aid agreements can be suspended. And of course, many of their people will go hungry, and some of them may die. In many cases, the need for food aid diminished. After all, we just have a limited amount of food aid. The Congress appropriates this year about $1.3 billion, including ocean transportation. That means we have about $1 billion worth of food aid, and there's always more demand for that than we have, than we have aid available. And we've got to decide here on where the top priorities are, where it goes. And again, I'll state very frankly that my own personal opinion is if we get a government or, or get a country that, that is openly anti-American, if they run counter to our policies, if they criticize us, if they make speeches about the, 
great imperialism in this country and that type of thing, I'm not very sympathetic to, to that kind of country. And I think the American people increasingly are not sympathetic to that kind of treatment. I think you've seen that in our representation in the United Nations, for example, with Pat Moynihan there, where Pat was very outspoken with the full concurrence and support of the president, and I may say the full support of the people of the United States, that, that, that we simply refuse to lie down and be kicked around without standing up. Uh, and I think that any country that gets kicked around, the way some of these countries try to kick the United States around, would not have a continuing flow of aid to those countries. With respect, Mr. Secretary, how can a small, poor, hungry country kick around the wealthiest and most powerful nation on earth. They have the same vote in the United States, in, in the United Nations that Great Britain has or the United States has. And some of those countries don't have, some of those countries don't have half the gross national product that London has. And yet they'll vote just the same vote that Great Britain has or the United States has. Are these the countries on the so-called ZAP list? I'm not familiar with the ZAP list, so I don't know what that is. But surely, Mr. Secretary, everybody in Washington knows about the ZAP office. We've been told many times about it. I'm not Th familiar with it. Let's see. But a ZAP office does exist. Or perhaps Dr. Butts knows it by its bland official title, the Office of Multilateral Diplomacy. The existence of the ZAP office was admitted publicly last March by a senior State Department official, John A. Baker. Its function is not to zap automatically the food aid agreement with a country opposed to American policies, but to play a cat and mouse game. As Dr. Kissinger himself has said, should any country engage in a continuous pattern of hostility to the US at the United Nations, such a prolonged pattern would definitely be a heavy factor in considering our bilateral relations with that country, particularly in determining the appropriate levels of assistance. I asked Peter Henriot, what he knew about a list of ZAP countries. It's not a publicly revealed kind of, uh, of list, but I think we can be, at least in terms of, uh, of the policy, several of the African countries that have consistently joined in that solidarity of the third world bloc against the United States and are countries that, as a matter of fact, are dependent upon some humanitarian assistance, some PL-480 assistance from the United States. So we're talking about the sub-Saharan states, the Sahelian Countries states. Countries like Sierra Leone, which, uh, which doesn't give support to the United States and indeed gets virtually no food. Gets virtually no food, votes against us in many ways, and yet is a nation that has a great deal of need. Uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, some classic examples in terms of, uh, of uh, the Southeast Asian states that were, uh, we were militarily uh, involved in and supporting, uh, the uh, South Vietnam, uh, uh, Cambodia. Now some people uh, and many people in the United States uh, uh, I think I think a, a good deal of general public would say well that's not manipulations that's just you know realistic use of something we have. The Arabs use uh, uh, oil power you know to advance there. Why can't we use food power? I at least would say from some kind of an ethical humanitarian point of view that food and oil are two different commodities. Uh, one relates to basic uh, survival and the right to survival. Another relates to survival in a more general way and a lot of the uh, superfluities of life. But I don't think you can treat food in the same category that you can treat oil. We can oil. do without oil, but not without food, perhaps. We can do without oil with difficulty. We can do without food, not at all. You know, the scripture yes. says man lives not by bread alone, uh, but he doesn't live very far without bread. Up to 1974, the U.S. government had paid American farmers three billion dollars not to plant millions of acres of cereal crops. This kept the world price inflated, and as a result, the food that was available was beyond the reach of those countries on the ZAP list, like Chile, and countries like Bangladesh that were considered strategically expendable and had no reserves of hard currency. Hunger, said President Harry Truman, is fostered not by scarcity, but by greed. Lester R. Brown is a leading Washington economist and president of the World Watch Institute. The dependence on uh, North American food uh, um, is increasing rapidly, and it's not only poor countries or small countries, it's uh, countries everywhere. The U.S. Department of Agriculture publishes trade data, agricultural trade data, for some 115 countries now. Of that 115 countries, one can count on the fingers of one hand the important exporters remaining. 
Over the past um, uh, 20 years or so, there have been literally scores of new food importing countries to emerge in the world. There has not been a single new exporting country of any significance in global terms. The, um, uh, this has been entirely a one-way street. Not only the number of food importing, importing countries increased, but the degree of dependence has increased. There are now close to a dozen countries in the world that import more than half of their total food supply, and that list is, is getting longer. Not only are poor countries, which lack purchasing power, affected when food becomes scarce and when prices rise, but large countries, such as the Soviet Union, are affected. Interestingly, for the past two years, per capita grain use in the Soviet Union has moved above that in the United States. Not because the Soviets are that well fed, but because of the enormous inefficiencies in the Soviet system. When the Soviet Union has a, a poor crop, its food deficit is so large that there is no other country or combination of countries in the world that can respond to it other than the United States. Um, this leads to a very interesting political scenario, um, uh, which is that uh, uh, not only do countries everywhere uh, have a vested interest in avoiding a Soviet uh, nuclear attack on the United States, but the Soviet Union itself does one would at least have to credit the Soviets with being uh, intelligent enough not to bite the hand that feeds them. And it is the United States that's feeding the Soviet Union today. I saw a cartoon a few months ago in the New York or somewhere and it showed a, a Soviet classroom and it showed this Soviet school teacher with a long pointer pointing to a map and saying, you know, here children is the breadbasket of Mother Russia. And it was pointing to Iowa and the United States, the breadbasket of Mother Russia, because the Soviet Union has become very dependent upon its ability to enter into the international markets and purchase immense amounts of grains, purchase from the United States. Well, that puts a very interesting twist upon all the arguments about detente. Mr. Butts, you have said, and I quote, food is a weapon. It is now one of the principal negotiating tools in our kit. I'm wondering what you meant by that. It can be one of the principal diplomatic tools. I didn't say negotiating tools. I think mm -hmm. diplomatic tools. We did and did use it last summer when we interrupted sales to the Soviets, for example, for a three-month period. Mm -hmm. uh, out of this, we got a long-term agreement on Soviet purchases. They have obligated themselves to purchase a minimum of six million tons of wheat and corn, even in their years of good production and may buy up to eight million tons in any year with no questions asked. If we have it beyond that and it's available to sell to them, we'll sell it. We have, uh, this was the use of agri-power, I think, to achieve a desired end. I think we have to be careful that we don't make our farmers pawns on the chessboard of our State Department or the Department of Foreign Affairs, as external affairs, as you might say, in Great Britain. On the other hand, if we get some countries dependent on us for their food supplies, as is becoming increasingly true of some of the, of some of the socialist nations of Eastern Europe, uh, if they build up their livestock populations based on a continuing flow of feed grains and soybeans from this country, they don't dare do anything that jeopardizes the flow of those food grains. That's a long-term positive use of agri-power. Perhaps the evidence presented so far might lead you to think that one nation's use of its resources as a means to political end is simply part of the great cynical international game. The trouble with this thinking is that the game, the denial of food to hungry people, has a corrupting effect on even the most powerful players and in the long term threatens even their survival. Why? Because no matter how rich or poor, obese or starving, we are all of us in the same troubled sea, as Peter Henriot now explains. A few nations are on a lifeboat. Uh, and there's a lot of nations that are swimming around in the water and they want to get on our lifeboat. But as in a shipwreck, if you let all the survivors get on just the one lifeboat that's able to be making it, then that lifeboat sinks and we all go down. And so therefore you have to shove some people off. That's the only humane thing to do in order to ensure that some survive. The lifeboat analogy, Garrett Hardin, Professor Garrett Hardin has used this analogy, says the rich nations, the industrialized nations, in order to be truly humane, are going to have to let other nations be expendable. But what it doesn't ask is, uh, you know, how did we get in the lifeboat? Uh, why isn't there more room in our lifeboat? Uh, 
you know, maybe we should throw off some of the golf clubs and some of the stereo sets and some of the big refrigerators that are in this lifeboat in order to let some more human beings in it. Number one, it doesn't say, uh, uh, it says these people are just swimming around there in the water, the poor nations. No, they've got little rafts of their own. And, and you know, given a better chance, their little rafts might not be as big as our big lifeboat, but they'd make it. But number two, we've built our lifeboat out of some of the logs from their little rafts. Mm. And number three, we need some of those logs to keep afloat. And number four, our lifeboat is very inefficient. It's got a lot of, you know, junk in it. Uh, number five, if their life, little lifeboats, their little rafts, begin capsizing, it'll make the water very unstable and, as <laughs> a matter of fact, cause us to mm. be unstable. Uh, another sort of a thing is they're swimming around there. They don't want to necessarily get into our lifeboat, everybody be equal. They at least want to have enough of a raft to be able to survive. You may remember this horrifying film from Bangladesh, which I showed last year. I show it again because, good harvest or bad, the situation will never really change in Bangladesh and in countries like it, while they are dependent on the fickle and political charity of a great power. This dependence is an inevitable part of agri-power which forces the poorest countries into an endless cycle of poverty. While all their foreign exchange goes on imported food, they cannot begin to develop themselves, to invest in farm technology, and to make themselves self-sufficient. Of course, in this way, poor countries are kept politically weak and ineffectual on the world stage, unlike China, for example, which is not dependent on anybody. Human civilization is very tenuous, very fragile fabric, and it can be broken in very easy ways. And I think that one of the things that kind of holds us together and promotes us is a humanitarian response that sees brothers and sisters as equals and we don't let little babies die while we worry whether this is diet cola or how many potato, how many calories are in this potato. If we move into a political stance, a military stance, an economic stance, that as a matter of fact begin saying who lives and who dies on the basis of political, economic, and military reasons, then we're straining that very thin, tenuous, fragile fabric of civilization. I think, and to uh, cite a, a British uh, author, C.P. Snow, several years ago, was asked one time in a television interview, I think, you know, what would be the most terrible thing that could happen in the world? That, uh, you know, millions would die of starvation, and he said, no, the most terrible thing that would happen is that millions would die of starvation and we'd watch them die on colored television. He didn't say the next point, but I say it. That's because we die too. Because what kind of a world does it mean to live in that we maintain our present standards, situations, etc., by the expense of millions of dying? We're not alive then, in any kind of human sense. Perhaps some of you have become immune to images of horror coming from places that seem so remote and hopeless. Indeed, if this film has attacked only your emotions, then it has failed. Because starvation is not caused by hopelessness or fatalism, but by political decisions taken by those who control most of the world's economy. For too long, the rich world, and that includes Britain, has solved its conscience with convenient myths about hunger. Myth number one is that the world is running out of food. In fact, two and a half times the present cultivated land of the world is not being farmed properly or even farmed at all. Why? Because the wealthiest nations, and especially America, control and waste most of the food and do not seriously help or even allow the poor nations to develop themselves and to kick the habit of having to sift the crumbs in the so-called free markets of the West. Myth number two has to do with population control, which we preach endlessly. The truth is that rapid population growth will stop only when people are freed from a system that keeps them poor and powerless. The agri-power of Dr. Earl Butts is a pillar of such a system. Do the Buttses and the Kissingers have to actually see a child starved to death on colored television before they understand what kind of dangerous and pointless world they are passing on to all our children.
programme you've just seen, reporter John Pilger was expressing a personal view.